Hey guys, Jordan West, e-commerce entrepreneur here. Today, I got to sit down with John Richards from Nomadic. John is an absolute expert when it comes to Kickstarter campaigns. He has run 10 Kickstarter campaigns and generated over $13.5 million. And he walked me through exactly how he does it. He gave me one trick uh, using Facebook ads over to Kickstarter that I had never heard before. You guys are going to get a ton out of this episode with John. Today's video is brought to you by Mindful Marketing. They use ads to get you off using ads. Most e-commerce brands rely heavily on Facebook and Google ads for the majority of their revenue. At Mindful Marketing, they use paid ads to build you a community of loyal and repeat customers that will exist long after Facebook and Google. So go to mindfulmarketing.co to find out more. Now on to today's episode. I have John Richards from Nomadic here. John, welcome to Secrets to Scaling Your E-Commerce Brand. Thanks for having me. I don't know if you can tell, I feel like I'm like really caffeinated right now for some reason. I'm just like, I got the energy. I got, I've had some good meetings today. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you. Um, yeah, so for people who don't know you, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. So my name is John Richards, grew up here in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, we started a brand seven years ago called Nomadic. Um, our first launch into the market was through Kickstarter. Uh, we just developed a little wallet, a, a minimalist pull tab wallet. Um, it was just more of a side hustle for fun. Ended up raising $170,000 through, through that crowdfunding campaign and realized we had a real business. Um, jumped out of my full-time job and, and dove into Facebook ads and similar uh, to you, just kind of figured that out. And that allowed us to scale the brand over the last seven years. Awesome, awesome. So that all started with Kickstarter. I think what I'm super excited about is that uh, for you, Kickstarter has been a massive piece of continued growth. Um, and you guys have done absolutely uh, incredible on Kickstarter. I'd love to hear like, like so, so how, how many campaigns have you guys done over the years. Yeah, so in the past seven years, we've done 10 different Kickstarter campaigns. Um, as soon as the Kickstarter campaign ends, we go to Indiegogo in demand. And so if you include both of those uh, funding platforms, we, we raised over $13.5 million uh, through crowdfunding. Um, we launch an average of, yeah, one to two campaigns a year. And it's um, it started out with just wallets, notebooks, things like that, small accessories, and we've transitioned all the way to full time, full size luggage and backpacks and bags for travel. John, how do you figure out which products make sense? Because I'm assuming you're not running every single product through Kickstarter, or, or are you? So we, we run about 90, 95% of our products through Kickstarter. There is a small percentage that will launch on our own website, like we just launch some hand sanitizer and face masks and things without releasing that on Kickstarter. But those are usually products that we haven't um, spent like years designing, um, putting a ton of effort into. They're more just like swag products, things like that. So uh, for our main core uh, products, we launch all of those through Kickstarter. And it takes about a year and a half to design and develop products. And we do it all in house. It's from scratch. We don't take a, a bag out of China and just slap our name on it. This is something we we really deliberate over every detail, every feature, the fabrics, make sure that it's it's the best quality we possibly can come up with. And then, um, yeah, we re release that on Kickstarter to the public. And then, um, you know, we, we, we've we averaged about a million dollars per campaign. Um, and wow. it, it's been, it's been the best platform that you, we could possibly have used to scale our business because it's allowed us to get that funding up front without having to seek um, outside funding or debt options and, and give up equity. So it's it's really, I don't see a better business model to bringing products to market than using Kickstarter to fund them. It's it's absolutely incredible. I mean, it gets the hype, right? It build, builds that, that sort of hype machine. Uh, and then for all of us running physical product stores, we know that cash flow is is the thing that is going to kill you, right? 
um, as you scale, right? When you go, when you move from that like two to five million dollar mark, right? You're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know I needed this much, <laughs> right? If you don't have a good, you know, CFO that's helping you out or, or something like that. And Kickstarter really does alleviate all of that. Now, have you ever gone to market on Kickstarter with a product and it's been an absolute flop? So we, I don't know what you would classify as a flop. I would say like we we launched um, we launched an entire line of bags right in the height of COVID. So okay, like it was <laughs> travel like, bags. Yes, travel <laughs> bags in like April of last year. It was like oh no right off of lockdown, and it was like okay, no, literally no one's traveling right now in the entire world, and let's show them like this bag we've been working on for two years, and say hey, buy this, you know. So. I wouldn't say it was a flop because we still raised we still raised six hundred and eighty thousand dollars or something like that seven hundred thousand so it was a great campaign but when you look at that compared to some that we've done in the past like the previous one we raised two point two million so to, in in our standard it was like man That's we worked a, yeah. really, we worked really hard on that line of bags and they they didn't perform um, but to everyone else's standard it still was a great campaign we still sold thousands of products and. Um, People love them. So yeah, I, I would just say that was probably our, our biggest disappointment of a campaign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, and 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 I mean, it's interesting as you scale, right? 600,000 at one point could have been an incredible launch, um, you know, and then after you're used to doing these these bigger ones, it's like, oh, okay, well, that, that didn't work out as well. Also, you definitely didn't have, uh, didn't have the easiest time of this world. There probably yeah. won't, while you and I are alive, be another time like this where you can't sell travel bags. No, totally out of our control. It wasn't what we were anticipating, but we really had no choice because COVID hit our whole business because we, we mainly sell travel bags. So we knew we were gonna be strapped for cash. And so we had to launch these products despite everything that was happening. And we just tried to paint a picture of like, travel will come back one day, like just keep these in your closet and save them for that rainy day or, or that day that travel finally comes back. Um, and there was a lot of other travel going on. You know, there was people that were that were um, doing stateside trips and things like totally. that, or going to the cabin. So hopefully, you know, of that line that we launched, we still had three of those that were slings, more for everyday use. And so, okay, that that's what they kind of latched onto, and those sell those sold really well. I have to say, during this time, therapeutically, my wife and I uh, have bought um, luggage. <laughs> We're just like, we know it's coming back. Travel is not dead. Travel will come back at some point. Um, I'm actually even, I, I didn't mention this before. I'm actually in the midst of uh, one of the deals that we're doing, one of the acquisitions uh, actually has a travel magazine attached to it. Cause I really do believe travel's coming back. It's just, yeah. it's, it's coming back. So um, it's not here right now though. So um, I'm essentially getting that magazine for free. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, I, I had a question for you. Um, with all of this experience, I mean, I don't know anybody else who's raised thirteen and a half million dollars uh, through crowdfunding campaigns like this before. Do you have a formula? Is is there is there some m absolute must dos before a campaign, during a campaign, after a campaign? I'd, l I'd love to just break that down. Yeah, yeah, totally. We definitely have a process that we stick to. Um, uh, you know, it's. It's uh, taken us a long time to, and it's always changing because of the, the nature of what's happening in the world. Like Facebook ads, for example, have almost doubled in cost year over year. And so what used to drive a ton of revenue to our campaigns, we've had to kind of shift the focus to working with influencers and different different other outlets that are driving traffic that so we're not reliant so much on Facebook ads. So um, I would say early on, like, some of the myths of Kickstarter is if you have a good enough idea, you can just put it on there and it will go viral, like false. Um, I would say like, if you're gonna launch a product on Kickstarter, you need to have a good marketing plan in place. And part of that is lining up PR, it's uh, figuring out the Facebook ad side, it's a thing. But for us, it's always been more about the product and making sure that we were just totally dialed on what we were offering the consumers. Because if they can just go find something on Amazon that's very similar, they're not going to be willing to wait four to six months for that product. And so yeah. Kickstarter is kind of a unique platform like that, where you have to offer something uh, upfront that's very unique and compelling. And so they're willing to actually give you money in advance. Um, so, so that's kind of like probably my first tip is just make sure that your product, like it stands out and it's got some feature or something that sets it apart from the competition. 
Yeah, um, that, I mean that that makes a- absolute sense uh, on Kickstarter even more than than anything. Uh, I was just recently talking to um, a guy who's launched and sold about ten Amazon brands. Um, and very similar for him when he's looking into a brand. He's not trying to create something that's never been created before, um, but making it compelling enough and that little tweak that it needs um, to really stand out in a crowded marketplace. Totally. That, that's probably one of the biggest things is just figuring out that paid media strategy. Because if you can dial that in um, and figure out a way to just have a really awesome product, then the marketing side is easy because the videos all become easy, all of that. So. We spent a ton so where of time are you building. sending? Sorry, 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 sorry to interrupt you. Where are you sending traffic with with paid ads when, so when you're running of, one of these campaigns? We it's it's totally like uh, Jimmy rigged. Like we so so Kickstarter doesn't allow you to put a Facebook tracking pixel on their site <laughs> currently. What a pain! <laughs> so imagine trying to figure out how to target and you know build look like audiences based on people that are visiting. It's it's impossible. So. We had to figure out a way to get creative where we'll actually send traffic um, to a redirect uh, site and they'll bounce off of that and get sent back to the Kickstarter page. So we're able to capture their information. Um, Have you had your ad account shut down for that? No. No, and no warnings? No warnings, it's totally legal. You can do oh. it through, yeah, the Kickstarter doesn't mind if you do this. It's just, it's just they, they hit the page, they bounce and it goes straight to Kickstarter and then, um, it's it's the only workaround we found that works really well. And you know, honestly, we we built an entire agency around this. We were able to help a lot of people scale their campaigns, and then um, sold that agency. Ended up um, working with outside agencies ourselves. After trying to run it ourselves, it was like, let's just work with others. We felt like there was there's a couple out there that have much bigger email lists than us. Um, there's one company in particular named Jalop that. If you're going to run a crowdfunding campaign, they're kind of known in the industry for being one of the best crowdfunding marketing experts. And they have um, and an always, email list that you can leverage. Yeah, and I don't actually know where they got that list. I mean, rumor rumor has it they scraped Kickstarter forever ago, like back when that was allowed, and they were able to capture like seven plus million email addresses. So I don't, I don't actually know what their list looks like. I have no idea how they got a hold of it, but. Um, they've run so many Kickstarter campaigns now that they have just like a huge database they can target and build audiences off of. And so we just kind of keep going back to them um, and they do a great job. So it's we, we've gone everywhere from running it ourselves to running it to actually building an agency and running it ourselves. And then now we've outsourced it to uh, an agency to manage it all for us. So. So I, 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 I get the, the sort of best practices of, you know, making sure you have an incredible product, something that people can't just go get on Amazon. Running traffic, I love that redirect idea. I'd, I'd never heard of that. I'm not, I, I'm not in this world. So um, of course that makes so much sense, right? Get a quick page load and then, and then hit them over there. And then at least you can pixel that audience. Yeah. Um, the I, I guess the where have you made mistakes on the fulfillment side because i can imagine that that is a massive headache months later is that true or is that the easy part it's it's totally true in fact it's been the biggest the fulfillment side has always been the biggest uh struggle we've had as a company because it's easy it's been easy for us to create market and sell products but then trying to deliver on time and trying to make sure that it's done effectively so we we've been lucky enough to deliver, you know, our campaigns pretty much down to the month that we promised. So we never were one of those campaigns that said, "Hey, we'll give this to you," and then we wait like a year and it's everyone's just totally pissed off. That's never happened to us, luckily. Um, but with that being said, like with our with our first campaign ever, we shipped all of our product out of China direct to consumer from China, um, wow. and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Ten percent of all shipments just disappeared, <laughs> like. <laughs> completely gone <laughs> off the planet. Did they have it tracking really, numbers and they were just gone? No, no tracking. Okay, okay. <laughs> so it was like the most cost efficient way to run the campaign. We we're like, we just want to make as much money as we possibly can. This was just like, like a side hustle at the first, right? So we're like, let's just ship these wallets via like Hong Kong Post. And we, we send it out and like literally, I, I was I was maxing out my uh, email account every day. I was sending over 500 emails a day trying to like, help our customers that were freaking out like i still have not received my product um 
And that was that was like the biggest logistical nightmare we've ever dealt with. We ended up just sending them all a free wallet and replacing them. Um, but to to be like totally honest, the, the fulfillment side's never been easy for us. But I would just say like making sure you have a, a good third party that you're willing to work with. Don't ship out of China. Like ship it if you're if you're shipping direct to consumer. Maybe you can like find some hubs in like Netherlands or something that you can that you can go from there. But um, you know, make sure that you kind of dialed down that that logistics process that is good that is very good to know i mean for for a lot of people fulfillment is one of those pieces you know they can sell things they can market things and the fulfillment piece comes in and and that's really where your money is is eventually made right on the repeat customer side on the uh you know higher customer lifetime value and if you screw up on the fulfillment side they're probably not going to come back <laughs> totally um, I got to ask you the question I ask everybody who comes on this pon uh, podcast. Uh, what is your secret to scaling? You know, I mean, we've kind of been talking about Kickstarter and I hate to keep referring to that, but when it comes to like scaling our company um, between Facebook ads and Kickstarter, we were that's what's basically built our company because it it's allowed us to, like you said, build that hype. It's transferring um, traffic from a social platform like Facebook to another social platform like Kickstarter where they feel like they're part of a community. They feel like they're helping innovate on an idea. They were giving us feedback. We were making product changes based on their feedback. And there's nowhere else you can really do that. I mean, if you're just getting sent from a Facebook ad and landing on a random website, you feel no human interaction there. You just, you know, it's, it's just about buying that product. and. And so once you land on like a Kickstarter page and you feel like you're now part of a, a community and you're able to like talk to other people in the comments and um, really just express your opinions and feel like you're being heard, that's that's what's allowed us to build a loyal following. I mean, we've had as high as like some of our campaigns when we launch, as high as 50% of our um, backers of that campaign are returning customers. They're people that just love our brand and they're excited to come back and support it again. Uh, and so we we owe everything to those original you know Kickstarter backers that have followed us throughout all the years. Yeah, that's a great that's a great answer. Thanks. I I, I love this conversation. I've really enjoyed this this talk around Kickstarter. Honestly, I feel like even just that one little tweak that you gave about <laughs> about the redirect, I'm like, oh, I I just don't think like that. Uh, so that's yeah. I mean, every problem in the world is solvable. So I'm glad that you've yeah. solved. <laughs> that problem <laughs> yeah the hope is they eventually will put a pixel on their website but I, I think for those who are struggling to run facebook ads you know i'd recommend using an agency if you're not very experienced yourself but if you if you feel like you're up for it you know there there are ways to run those those redirects or to to message people directly on kickstarter to kind of like get feedback on demographic information so you can know how to better target things like that yeah yeah, wonderful. Uh, we're gonna move on to our lightning round here, John. Uh, hope you are ready. Do it. All right. What is your favorite tool or app that you're using right now? Oh man, this is a funny answer, but YouTube. <laughs> for YouTube, for okay. Whatever, it's like my favorite go-to place to answer any question. Like if I'm editing a video or if I'm, it doesn't matter what business problem, or even if I'm just like, redoing something in my house. I'm always on YouTube trying to figure out hacks or ways to do it. I've restored a, a motorcycle through using YouTube. And I just think it's it's such a unique platform that you can go to. And obviously there's a lot of junk on there, but you can find pretty much anything you're looking for. And for someone like me, that's like, I believe I can do anything. I just have to find someone to teach me how to do it, like how to run Facebook ads or whatever. It just takes some time. And I'm, I just love that app because it allows me to just learn and grow in ways that I never thought I could. Now I can edit videos or do whatever I want because of that. I, that's a that's a great answer. I mean, really, like anytime you need to solve a problem, that is just the first place to go. Like I, I recently had a, a plug at my house, a GFCI plug, and I was like, is that different than a regular plug? Can I do that myself? And so I text my dad and he's like, I don't know, let's look on YouTube. I'm like, oh yeah. yeah, that's right. I'm the one who should be saying that to you, dad. <laughs> uh, awesome. Uh, favorite podcast or audiobook that you're listening to right now? Oh man, 
I just finished uh, Atomic Habits for the second time. Ah, oh, great book. I, I don't know what it is about that book. I, I've read, you know, hundreds of business books, and of those, they're all just, they have these big ideas and these great things, and it's like, man, you get so inspired as you're reading it, but Atomic Habits is the first one that I'm like, this is actually applicable. Like, I can take these things and actually make significant changes in my life. Um, and so I've actually just built, like, my entire, like my goals and my habits and everything that I'm tracking right now is all built around that book. I've just loved it. That's great. What, what do you think your biggest takeaway from Atomic Habits is? That it's not about, it's not about like, um, it's the tiny, yeah, it's all those tiny changes that, that essentially make the, the massive results. It's not about like, oh, I'm going to write a book this year and set that goal. Like who cares about the goal? The, 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 pro, the, the, the thing you should be focusing on is your system. It's like, okay, if if I want to write a book, I need to wake up, you know, at this time and spend, I don't know, 30 minutes yeah. just, just writing down ideas. And now it's like you're actually taking action towards your goal rather than, so you're changing the system and the process rather than focusing specifically on what what you want to accomplish, if that makes sense. Totally, totally. Yeah, I, th I think he calls it habit stacking. Where, uh, where, where you stack these, all of these like habits on top of the other one. And so somebody will ask, why do you do this thing every day? For me, it was um, uh, taking the stairs where our, our office is on the 12th floor. Um, and so for me, I was like, you know, I'm just gonna take the stairs every day. And that was my first habit that I started stacking on, right? Um, yeah. in, my, in my sort of like health habits. Cause then when you get up there, I'm like, well, I don't want coffee, I want water. <laughs> and so then I started drinking water. Yeah. And yeah, and it's the, like, habit stack, the habit stacking is nice for, yeah, for times when you do something every day, like if you brush your teeth every day, you know, it, the habit stacking, as I understand it, is the ability to just tack on something to something you already do. So, if, you know, if I know I'm going to brush my teeth at night, maybe right before I brush my teeth, I do 15 push ups. And now I'm essentially stacking a habit on top of something that already exists. You know what I mean? Um, I think you actually have a, the better definition of habit stacking than what I have. <laughs> but I like what you're saying and that's that you can you can continue to build and grow on habits as you as you and that's what he does say you know he says start with putting on your running shoes don't start with running 10 miles so start with the habit of every day I'm going to put on my running shoes and then you'll notice you go out for a walk and then you'll notice you make it on a five minute jog and pretty soon you have kind of like like you're saying stacked habits on top of each other to get to the point where you're running half marathons or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah, well, that's great, great answer. Uh, last question, if you could sit down with anybody who's alive right now, have some coffee, tea, beer, wine, who would it be? Oh man. It, it might be James Clear, <laughs> the author of Atomic Habits. I, I seriously, I, I look up to what he's accomplished and I would love to just sit down with him. I've built an entire program for myself based on his book. I would love to sit down with him and say, what do you think of this program? Can this be applied to like the masses? Cause it's something I would love to like launch into the world and say, hey, here's a way to track your habits and figure out ways to improve. Um, you know, there's lots of self-help and self-improvement courses out there and things like that, but. The one I've built is tailored to me and it, and it fits me really well, but I would love to see his opinion on it and just sit down with him and ask him. Cool. Hey, great answer. Great answer. I love that. Uh, John, thanks so much for your time today. Where can people find out more about you and connect with you? So if you want to see our website, it's nomadic.com. That's N-O-M-A-T-I-C.com. That's where we offer all, uh, all of our products. Um, you can enter your email there if you want to follow along for our, our new product drops. We have uh, a really exciting one coming here in the next month. So I would stay tuned on that. We have a, a fun Kickstarter campaign coming up. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks again for your time, John. Really great to have you. Thanks, Jordan. Wait, before you go, in the description, we've got some incredible e-commerce only resources for you to help scale your store from wherever you are into the mid seven figure, eight figure, maybe even mid eight figure range this year. So look in the description below for some incredible free resources uh, that we've given to you guys and we really want to see you guys succeed.